Hi, everybody. I'm Mark Plaster, and this is EP Talk, the place where emergency physicians and people interested in emergency medicine come to talk about things that are important to us, pro both professionally and sometimes personally. And I think this uh, today, uh, our guest is going to talk to us about some things I think will impact us uh, quite a bit. Our guest today is uh, Jeff Richards of uh, Snap Nurse. We'll talk about that in just a minute, but uh, I think most emergency physicians have experienced uh, this uh, situation where you've got beds in the ER that are mm -hmm. empty. You've got patients in the waiting room trying to get into those beds, but the, the hospital won't allow you to do that because you don't have staff. You don't have nursing staff to do that. And so that's a very frustrating situation for all of us. Uh, we, I think virtually every emergency department in the, in the country has had that situation. And in some cases, it's pretty dramatic. So the question is, how do you get more nurses? And uh, it, it's something that we as the physicians oftentimes don't really think it involves us, but it does. And so our guest today, Jeff Richards of Snap Nurse, uh, is going to tell us a little bit more about what he's done uh, to address that problem. Jeff, thanks for, uh, for joining us. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. We, we all know intuitively that uh, not having enough nurses affects us, but, but you're you're, you've addressed it more broadly. It's not enough nurses, period, right? Yeah, and I'll give you a little background on myself. I, I spent the first 19 years of my career as the chief anesthetist and director of anesthesia at Grady Hospital. So a large level one trauma center, academic safety net hospital in Atlanta, Georgia, right. um, constantly connected between the OR and the ER, you know, traumas that came sometimes straight through the ER and straight up to the OR. Sure. And um, the patient care and patient flow that you touched on in the beginning was part and parcel of how uh, how busy the the o e r was and the o r which was being fed by the e r and right. when things got backed up when you had not enough nurses many times to care for the patients and and things got overwhelmed and that has a huge impact on process and throughput where the patients end up and how quickly they end up going from the e r to the o r which I know those you know are, are highly connected in a big trauma center but they are elsewhere as well so. The ER is the front of the hospital, right? I mean, yep. ERs are impacted by, I think, nursing shortages, perhaps more than other parts of, of hospitals. And, and I think in some ways that's twofold because there's a portion of the population that's uninsured, which is slightly less than it used to be, which is good. We're making progress in that regard. But those that are un uninsured or underinsured use the ER as right. their uh, primary care and everybody in ER knows that, but sure. not everybody else knows that. But when you have that population uh, using it in that way, and then you have you know, not enough nurses, which everyone in healthcare experiences and is suffering, you know, during, and with that situation, the ER, I think, gets a kind of a double jeopardy because they've got increased utilization and then the shortage hurts right. even more so. And hospital administrators have often thought that if we build bigger ERs, <laughs> okay, that's all we need, you know, more beds. And so you build bigger ERs and guess what? You build it, they will come and the volumes go up and they can't staff it. And uh, and then I remember getting a call one time from the uh, department head saying, because uh, he could see a, a, the whiteboard at home and, mm -hmm. he, and he said, I, I see that your waiting room is jammed. And I was sitting here in a quiet ER. Okay, it was quiet nothing back there. He's, I can see that they're really jammed out there. You need to go out and see them in the waiting room. And I said, Hippa. we have empty beds. We have empty beds. Put them in the beds. He said, I can't put them in the beds. We don't have the nursing staff. So I said, exactly. you want me to do something that is really unsafe and is bad medical practice because we don't have the nurses. So that's, that's, that's my story. Right. Yeah. Physicians licenses get put into, you know, a, a kind of jeopardy because of the, the shortage in, in nursing staff, essentially. Go, go to the hallway and treat the patient on the gurney and, and the, the EMS people are standing there looking at the room. <laughs> They're looking at the room and they say they can't staff it. They, they won't, won't go in there. It's true. And, and that, that patient care does happen in the hallway. I've seen it many, many times. So that is probably the one step better than the waiting room, but it's, it's not, correct care. It's not the best care that we can give. So so how did you address that? Okay. Uh, you went from anesthesia to SNAP nurse. So how did that happen? Yeah. So for me, it was, I spent the last 10 years in administration. So I was in that intersection with one foot in the clinical world and one foot in the administrative world I, saying, you know, this is how it works over here. And then I was talking to people who were administrators that don't have that clinical day-to-day -day experience. They're like, well, no, you just need to do this, cut budgets, do this, rearrange it, get a, a less expensive workforce. Right. I'm like, it, 
care has to be delivered with these clinicians, with these skill levels and these degrees, and we're going to need this many of them. So what I did is I had uh, the discretion to have a PRN pool of clinicians. They were employed by the hospital. Okay. I did not have, and that's what SnapMers was, was born from. I did not have a software platform where I could go and log in and fill in my empty shifts picking and choosing from qualified clinicians on an interface, like a, a type of Uber for nursing or Amazon for healthcare staffing, we, maybe with a LinkedIn component, there, there just wasn't anything like that. So I had instead staffing agencies calling me, telling me, you oh, know, this is a great clinician and uh, you, know, you, you should use them. And I say, well, this is a level one trauma center. Anybody could be in a, a situation where they're in a lap coli and then you know, suddenly be treating a gunshot wound patient. So I'm gonna give you one dead simple criteria, which could easily be entered into an app. I said, just tell me if they've given one unit of blood in the last six months, because that's not going to happen in a GI center anywhere else. Without fail, they would send me some resumes. There'd always be someone from a GI center. I'm like, well, that person, there's no way <laughs> that person has given a unit of blood because that's not happening in a GI center. And of course they hadn't. So I just thought I could put in simple screening criteria, you know, with, through an interface that it's not there. Why does this not exist? And so I was in MBA school, wrote a paper on a mobile healthcare staffing app, and lo and behold, a classmate of mine from 19 years before reached out to me and said, hey, would you help me with my healthcare startup? It's called SnapNurse. So you know, we hit it off. We raised money together. We got the company launched. And so from the beginning, it was to create an online cloud-based solution that would allow facilities to go in and review the available talent that were local and for clinicians to sign up in an easy self-service manner. Uh, to get access to jobs. So the shortage, you know, pre-pandemic was growing, right? We knew this demographic change in the country was going to occur, that the the baby boomers were not only going to age out of the workforce, but then become patients in a number of years after that, which is still underway. And it's it's a pretty tough looking bubble for the next 10 years. And so we're losing the nurses in the workforce, and yet we're having an increasing and aging population that are going to become uh, more patients. All we can do, short of you know, a, a million nurse educational recruitment and training and education, which is largely going to have to be sponsored by the federal and, and deployed by state governments, I don't see any uh, impetus to go and do that. But in the meantime, we have to use the staff we have as efficiently as possible, which is essentially the, the value proposition of SNAP nurse, right? So hospitals are not great at having a flexible staff that's moving in and out. You know, maybe they're working at two different hospitals. I, as a manager, just did it myself. I had my SNAP nurse on my cell phone. I had 40 or so PRN clinicians. I was booking probably seven to 10 on a regular basis. Some of them were working almost full time, but it was horrible. I would send out a text to 12 people. I wouldn't get a response. Then I'd get two people that would take a shift. Then I'd get seven more responses. I'm mean, nope, the shift's already taken. I'm like, we got to do a better job. So SNAP nurse is... Uh, uh, an engine essentially that allows for all of those clinicians to be on the marketplace, all of the facilities to plug in, and then the facility themselves can push out a request to qualified clinicians that meet the criteria that they're going to put in there. So all of that has to be under the mindset of someone who thinks about the clinical requirements, credentialing is a huge part of it, HIPAA is right. a big part of it, and then you've got to have the technology, which you know it's it, we keep evolving as a company to you know, optimizing the credentialing component of our software, for example. And we've gone through three joint commission surveys, every single one of them without a single RFI, um, which I know your, your listeners will know how hard that is to do. <laughs> um, and it was hard at Grady. It's hard as a staffing company that's deploying software. But it also is somewhat a reflection of the fact that the, the surveyors that reviewed us from the joint commission said, you're so far ahead of the rest of the staffing industry. Yeah. So that's both a compliment, but also a reality that if if they're not doing that, then there's a pool of clinicians that, that want to travel, right? That's always been a thing. And even prior to COVID, during COVID, more nurses wanted to do that for a variety of reasons, right? Some of it was the incredibly challenging conditions in, in each of the locations where they were working. Some of it was an opportunity to have access to wages that they never had before. And some of them to get some flexibility and control over their schedule. So post pandemic, we have fewer nurses than we had pre pandemic. Yep. You know, companies that are utilizing software like ourselves are have reduced the friction to enable more of those nurses who want to be mobile to be connected to the facilities that need them. 
And that's that's essentially the value proposition of what we have to offer to facilities, the ability to have access to clinicians on a short term or even a contract basis, uh, you know, through the software. Sure. I, I heard uh, that you were actually recognized by Inc. Magazine. Is that right? Yeah. So we in 2022, we got recognized as the fastest growing company in America. Um, and initially we were second. This is kind of funny uh, because this just got announced two days ago when I was on a panel with Inc. 5000 here in Atlanta. The first company was um, a cryptocurrency company that is now insolvent. So we <laughs> are, <laughs> you have to stay solvent to, to, to maintain the position. So that's probably funny for your for your listeners. But then it does mean that, you know, uh, I think it's a good reflection for healthcare and, and technology and the intersection of the two that that that's the fastest growing company in America. Some a company that's trying to solve the ability to move, move nurses around in a more efficient way for the yeah. facilities that need them. Well, you know, uh, the the whole economy, we, we've talked about the gig economy, you know, mm -hmm. giving everybody the, the ability to be have control of their future. I, I did that for 30 years as an, as a locums uh, and, uh, and it, it enjoyed it, enjoyed the heck out of it, made a lot more money than I would have locally. And uh, now some people that wouldn't have liked the lifestyle, you know, uh, it was a lot of travel, um, but uh, I, I enjoyed it. I was flexible enough to do that. And uh, we've got a pretty significant pool of nurses out there who would uh, who would like to do that either locally, regionally, or in a, in a much larger capacity. And uh, I think that people are not recognizing how many nurses are actually out there, and yeah. uh, and who would yeah. come in if they if if they uh, had the ability to make it this easy. Exactly, and staffing companies they they live in that world. It's just the the efficiency to mobilize them and do it quickly and have a self-service interface, both for the nurse and for the facility is where, you know, it's, I would say in the past, that's the future. I'm just saying that's what you need right now. That's what we offer. Yep. And there's a handful of other tech enabled companies. They just haven't had this kind of growth. So it, you're right. That's right. There's a, a significant pool of clinicians more than ever who want that flexibility mobility, just like you had as a locums. And um, that's the, the group that we are, you know, connected to and want to get in front of all the facilities that want to have access to them in a way that's self-service for both sides. Now, you obviously in the title, SNAP Nurse, you're dealing with nurses, but you're dealing with more than that, correct? Yeah, that's a great call out. It's it. We started, you know, five, six years ago now in 2017, um, squarely focused on nursing and the nursing shortage. But as we went through the last six years, we've expanded into everything. So we're deploying every kind of healthcare clinician short of physicians which is interesting because as you mentioned locums, the, the one of the huge biggest challenges of physicians is the credentialing component, which is something that, you know, I think what we've created will be well suited. When we're ready to enter locums, it's going to be a, a really good matchup because of the credentialing, uh, the strength of credentialing that we've created. So give me, you, you said everybody, but give me the range of uh, clinicians that you're actually dealing with here. So the top of the license for us is nurse practitioners, um, PA, and then of course allied health, so physical therapists, occupational therapists, that's and respiratory therapists uh, and uh, surgical techs throughout. You know, a, a lot of the pandemic, there was a significant deployment of them, um, and then of course RNs, LPNs, CNAs. That's still the core part of our database and what the greatest demand that we see. Um, and then you know even uh, admins and food service, some of the other non-clinical oh, really? hospital. We've staffed at different times, so it's it runs the full gamut of almost every role inside of a hospital. We've had social workers, CT and uh, ultrasound techs. We have that's that's a very tiny part of the database. That's a really those techs are very niche. Um, it's it's okay. so we haven't we haven't had as much demand for them, but we have staffed it a few times. Okay, All yeah, right. I, I was just curious. Uh, what, uh, tell me a little bit about, uh, the practicality. Okay. Somebody is watching this and they say, Jim, <laughs> I'm looking at all these, uh, these empty beds, uh, and I'd like to, to get involved. Uh, give me a step-by-step -step, uh, of how a clinician could start to resolve some of the problems in their hospital. They're not an administrator. What would they do? Yeah. So you're talking about like a manager? Yeah. Uh, manager, just, uh, uh, what are the steps that they would, uh, employ to get, uh, into the SNAP, uh, SNAP nurse database? Sign a contract with Snapters. Uh, you, have to sign it, you have to sign a contract. So, of course, you know, you've got to start there, right? You'd have to escalate it to the leadership within the facility that has the capacity to sign a contract, get the contract signed, and then 
the op from there, it depends on the particular facility, right? A lot of times supplemental staffing is run out of either HR. Sometimes it's the CNO's office. Sometimes there's an individual supplemental staffing office, which we have at, at a lot of facilities that then is issuing those work requests to us, right? In the form of a job order, or, you know, I need 10 med surge nurses, or I need, you know, six in the ER, or I'm going to need uh, these 27 shifts covered. So it can be anything from that PRN style, you know, I've finished my schedule. There's 32 holes in the schedule. This is the qualified person I need. It's day shift and night shift and, and fill these shifts for me. Or, you know, I'm going to need 10 ER nurses for the next 13 weeks. Uh, I need them to start in the next 12 days. You know, here's the, you know, I'm going to, I want, want you to submit the packets, right? So they may go in and select them and then we give them the profiles that they would review and then accept them, then finalize credentialing, go through the process for a start date. And then they'd be, you know, admitted into the facility or onboarded into the facility to get started. Yeah. Now, uh, just as a matter of uh, transparency, does Snap Nurse work like a recruiter in from the standpoint of taking a small uh, cut of the pay or is it a software rental uh, model that you've used? It's it, it can be either, which is interesting, right? <clears throat> because we are in the process now of offering our software to help a facility manage an internal float pool. So you still benefit from the credentialing, the self-service onboarding, the shift request engine that pushes the requests out to a pool of candidates, much like I spoke about with before when I didn't have a way to do that. You know, typically inside of facilities, you've got Kronos is often the time and attendance solution. Not always. Sometimes it's a different one, but typically it's that. And so there's a connection between our software and Kronos so that you can push out requests either for long-term contracts or individual shift requests match up with the clinicians that are available and then, you know, have them uh, work the shift. So the internal flow pool version of that is that we're helping the hospital recruit clinicians that they will then employ when it's external, then it's, you know, those clinicians are employed by us. Some hospitals want that. They want to boost up, you know, fill up their own internal float pool. As we, oh. kind of the early part of our conversation, they, they know they've got the patients and they've got beds, physical space, but maybe they didn't increase the number of clinicians to do that. And they're not good at it, right? They may be good at capturing the ones that they know will work full time and they want to be on a benefit track, right. but not the ones that want that flexibility, that gig style of working. You right. need to approach them differently. And that's right. sort of our, our superpower. Especially with uh, women who are um, have families, children, small children. Uh, they approach a hospital and say, I want, I'd love to work for you, but I can only work two or three or five or two. 10 shifts a month, you know, and nobody's going to hire them like that uh, unless they're in like a float pool. And, uh, and that that's perfect for them. That is exactly right. That flexibility that you don't, you don't want to miss out on those clinicians. Well, there's only so many clinicians left. So you have to meet them where they are. That's how I usually refer to it, or you're not going to get them at all. And someone's going to figure it out. Someone's going to meet them where they are, or they'll end up working for an agency or a platform because right. that's the only way they can find the flexibility they need. But even the agencies and platforms uh, oftentimes require them to have a larger commitment than they uh, are wanting to have. I, my uh, daughter uh, is a labor and delivery nurse and uh, uh, has uh, three small children and and probably would like to get back in and, and do some more work. But it's either full or or it's a, a partial part time. It's because of benefits, yada, yada, yada. So she doesn't do anything at all. And uh, yeah, please refer her to Snap Nurse so immediately after the spot. <laughs> <after this podcast. laughs> Tell me a little about uh, the rate of adoption. Uh, we talked about the everybody's recognized your um, platform for its efficiency and what it's doing. Obviously, uh, if if they're recognizing that, you must be growing. Uh, tell me oh, yeah. about that. Well, yes, the it's interesting because clinicians six years ago immediately flocked to the platform. They just the ease with which they'll go and sign up, you know, submitting credentials because they can do it all self-serve and they can do it from their phone. So they they just jumped like at everything, it. like everything now. Yes, you can like everything phone. else. I mean, of course you should be able to sign up uh, as a clinician and submit credentials, take a picture of your license, take a picture of your ACLS card and have that then digitized and saved there. So you're not having to go grab it or carry it around or anything else like that. You know, it's it's archived there then. It's in it for every, any job that you might want. So it's so easy. Facilities, I say it almost like I said about the nurses, you got to meet them where they are. Some of them are going to jump in, you know, they're going to do a login, understand how it works. Some of them are going to send you an email and say, I want 10 nurses. I'm like, well, you could put an order in, but you, you, so adoption is, I think, 
a work in progress where you meet facilities wherever they are. The, the pandemic accelerated the interest and appetite for, I think, uh, to be utilizing software and trying to find efficiencies. Um, and it happened not just for us, a lot of uh, Kronos users, uh, facilities, jumped forward to their workforce dimensions, which is the cloud-based solution, which is a boon for us as well. So if the time and attendance interface is, is online, is in the cloud, then we can connect to their API and you're just gonna, the facility gets such a better user experience because the clinician is punching in and punching out using their system and it's just flowing across to ours. And one of the value propositions of Snap Nurse is that we pay the nurses daily, right? We, we knew that was something that's gonna be from the beginning, we wanted it to be like an Uber. You, you work a shift, you clock in, you clock out. It has to be approved by the manager. Then we're going to let you get paid instantly. Wow. So we made that a benefit and it was valuable. People loved it. But when the pandemic hit, that is a piece of how we scaled because you needed thousands of nurses all over the country moving around constantly. You know, at the height of the pandemic, you couldn't get rental cars. It was difficult to get hotels because there just weren't enough people. Yeah. Um, and they were sick. There was enough cars. So you needed to have access to your pay right away. And, you know, post pandemic, it's it's still something that we the nurses do 50 to 60 percent of the time. They take that option. Um, and so in order to do that, you need that the best case is to be integrated with a time and attendance solution. So it's it's a uh, it's very attractive. Now, I, I'm going to ask you this from the standpoint of a physician listening to this and saying, this sounds like a great idea. It sounds like it's going to be growing like crazy. I'd like to get involved in it. Are there, uh, is this a, a private equity thing that's owned uh, by you and your partner and, and, uh, and private equity? Are you going to, are you going to IPO at some point? Uh, how, would people, uh, people like to get involved in that? Because if we're inside the industry, we see, we see things at work. Sure. Okay. We see things that are really uh, growing opportunities. Uh, is there an opportunity like that? I think there could be an opportunity. There's We have a diverse group of shareholders. We do have one uh, family office, private equity backer, the Pivotal Group out of uh, out of Scottsdale, Arizona. Um, there there could be a time in the near future where there's, there's an opportunity to invest and um, we should keep that line of communication open. It's, it's not something that's happening right now, and it could be that it, that it does turn into an IPO, right? We may become a public company. I don't think we're ready for that or yeah. want to do that in the next you know, two years or so, but um, we're always open to investment. I think one, one interesting angle is getting the facilities that use the, the solution to be investors, part of the board, you know, healthcare is a, it's a team sport to provide patient care. And to solve a problem as big as the nursing shortage is going to require massive collaboration across multiple facilities and whether they function in the form of an advisory board, you know, and those that can be the physician, physician leaders, it can be administrators like the C-suite of the hospital. There's definitely uh, a place for a significant place for added voices, you know, especially clinical leadership to give us input and guidance and guide their facilities to you're asking me to fill those 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 rooms with patients. Well, I can't get access to the nurses. Here's a company that's trying to solve this problem. How do we collectively work together, you know, to solve something that everybody wants to see solved? Right, right. Fascinating. Uh, for our uh, listeners, viewers, uh, I hope you've grasped uh, what you've been uh, seeing and hearing. Uh, uh, we all have a problem. We all do. You know that. Uh, and we all can get involved in solving it. Uh, and um, there is something that each one of us can do with our, within our administrations to uh, focus on bringing solutions to uh, the guys in the C-suite. Uh, they're not our enemies. They want, they're wanting to fix this just like anybody else. And yet their, their minds are locked within a certain uh, uh, way of doing things. And uh, this is a new world. Uh, we've learned that through uh, some of the companies like... Uh, Uber and and uh, the the gig economy uh, uh, corporations. So I would encourage you to think about uh, what Jeff's been talking about. Uh, see if uh, you have the the platform, the voice within your hospital uh, structure to bring this about. Because uh, it it's it may be a lot simpler to fix than you might think. And uh, when the technology is there, the 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 pool of people is there. It, it, it's, so it's just a matter of reaching them and reaching them on the level that they want to participate. 
So I hope you've heard something today that uh, is uh, helpful. Jeff, uh, how do they, how, would they, if somebody said, I want to find out about SnapNurse uh, website, uh, you. Absolutely. You can, always go to, you can always go to snapnurse.com. Okay. And if you're a clinician, it's going to guide you to a pathway to sign up. If you're a facility or even a clinician administrator that just wants to learn more, you would say facility and it'll take you to a pathway, fill out a short form describing what you need, what questions that you might have. And um, that'll go straight into our, our business development team and they'll reach out right away. That's super. That's great. This has been very, very helpful. Uh, I, I, it's something that uh, it makes us pull our hair out when we're uh, in the emergency department and uh, you're, uh, you, you're looking at empty beds and you're looking at a full uh, waiting room and, and that's got to be the, <laughs> that's the worst thing in the world. Okay. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Jeff, thank you for this has been an enlightening podcast uh, and I hope everyone's enjoyed it and uh, hopefully uh, we'll, we'll tackle this problem together. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for having me. Bye now.